Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to the NetHealth Expert Series. I am Vrinda Chaturvedi from NetHealth Secretariat with an interesting topic on monkeypox management preparedness, awareness, and prevention. We are past the halfway mark in 2022 and are still grappling with the long shadow of COVID-19 and getting hit by one new development after another. The most recent being monkeypox. The World Health Organization has already declared escalating monkeypox outbreak a public health emergency, like COVID in 2020, as more than 35,000 cases have been detected in 92 countries with 12 fatalities so far. In India, more than nine cases have been detected. However, the current scenario in India is mixed with low awareness levels, some fear and curiosity. Monkeypox is a viral zoonosis and has been transmitted from animals to humans. With symptoms similar to smallpox, not surprisingly, the lack of information around this infectious disease in India is leading to misinformation and even confusion, which need to be immediately addressed. And so today, in our expert series, we are discussing some very pertinent questions around monkeypox to get correct facts about preventing, managing, taking precautionary measures from diagnostic and treatment management perspectives. We are very, very pleased to have with us Dr. Vishal Vadwa, AVP Head and AVP and Head Scientific Affairs, Metropolis Healthcare Limited. Dr. Satish Kaul, Director, Internal Medicine, Fortis Memorial Research Institute. And Dr. Srinidhi Chidambaram, Vice President and Senior Cons Health Communications, Epidemiology, International Patients and Quality, Apollo Hospitals, who will talk and answer our questions about preparedness of the disease and also throw light on the need for awareness and prevention around monkeypox. So over to our experts and in, with immense pride, I would start with Dr. Vishal Vadwa. Sir, could you please help us understand where is the trend heading, location-wise, curve-wise? Is it as infectious as COVID or are there any special sample handling requirements? Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Vrinda, for giving me this opportunity. See, when we talk about trends or the epidemiological curve, we are basically talking about the incidence of infections over a time period. This disease is not new. The virus is not new. What has caught interest uh, for the whole world and WHO is that unlike the previous cases where this in these infections were happening only in the endemic countries and few pockets outside, but this time this epidemic has touched over 90 countries. And it is simultaneously, you know, occurring both in the epidemic, no, in the endemic and the non-endemic countries. Simultaneously, that is the important thing. So while the endemic countries are the African ones, if you see, there are over 49,000 cases now in this pandemic. And if you see the top 20 countries that are involved, it is the Congo, which is at number 19 among the endemic ones. The other ones are all non-endemic. USA being in the top of the list with 35, roughly 35% 35 cases is a non-endemic country. So the question that puzzles me and definitely the scientists around the world would be that why now? Earlier in 2020, it was COVID. Now in 2022, it is monkeypox. Why this monkeypox has suddenly changed stance? Why from non-endemic from endemic to sudden a jump from you know non-endemic countries and touching more non-endemic countries than the endemic ones? So that is the catch. That is the first point which will catch attention for everyone. The second point is the WHO declared it as a cause of concern in July when the cases were around 500 or 528. Then in you know, mid-July, it went to 800, August, nearly 900. But now, again, when we talk about 30th August, the latest data from CDC, it says the cases are only 416. So if we compare to the roller coaster ride of COVID-19, this looks like a child to me on the face of it. 
see if you draw a comparison i'm just talking about trends in three four different ways since you asked if we compare it with covid 19 the covid 19 in january was giving us 100 new cases per month per day sorry i'm talking about 2020 january and when i see monkeypox and by august it was giving us 2 lakh 60000 plus cases every day whereas monkeypox is already showing some decline and it is around 400 cases as of yesterday so it doesn't look to be that threatening as covid 19 definitely and, and the third layer of information or the interest is how transmissible is this virus see when we talk about transmission of a virus from one person to other the scientifically we call it the r value r o value or r e value um, in broader terms what, what it means is let us say if i am a virus and i have a value of two then i'll transmit the infection to two people for one suppose i am the main person i'll infect two more people and hence it is known as r2 now the understanding required here is why there is uncertainty is when this covid epidemic or pandemic began the ro value was 2.5 which means one person would infect 2.5 people but as omicron came in this whole ro value went to 8 which means i would infect eight more people who were not exposed to any other person so over the time the epidemic can evolve and this in this evolving nature of the epidemic especially in viruses is due to their ability to mutate if we go to any of the sites which are dealing with genomics monkeypox is also mutating but as of now there has been no variant of concern you know when we are reading so many newspapers all of us are epidemiologists now all of us not only microbiologists all people are epidemiologists and we all know what is r value we all know what is flattening of her and we understand what are variants but till date uh, the genomic sites have not come up with any variant of concern which means there is no variant which is more infectious which is able to reinfect people you see you, when you read newspaper a year back or two years back there were cases that he got infected third thrice you know he is immunized but he is getting infected such variants have still not been reported in monkeypox so so that is the good thing about monkeypox that it is the trend is not that shocking and the ro value is less mutants are not happening they are happening but they're not being reported as variants of concern so i hope i have answered the question on the trends of this monkeypox disease Thank you, sir. I mean, very insightful in terms of the evolving nature of the uh, this particular virus. So, uh, one more question I would like to address: that what kind of infrastructural requirement is needed to handle such samples in a lab? Yeah, that's a very important question. That how, as a nation or a world, are we prepared to handle this virus? As we know that the entire uh, strength of controlling any epidemic lies in uh, nation or the world's ability to detect the infection. If you can detect the infection, you can bring in the control measures, you know, and you can prevent the infection from spreading further. We are lucky that now we are we are lucky that we are now living in an area or the uh, times where COVID has already attacked us. Our labs are geared up. When I say this virus is less infective than COVID virus, and the one of the prime reason is it is not transmitted through droplet nuclei. I'll explain the viewers. When I cough, I secrete droplets of respiratory fluid, which which can travel, you know, two feet or three feet. Unless I'm practicing something which Leonardo DiCaprio practiced on Titanic, you know, he's trying to throw this putum far away. If I'm not trying that, my respiratory secretions will fall within two feet. And if any person is beyond that, he'll not get those secretions and not get infected. Now, these viruses like measles, mumps, even bacteria like tuberculosis, they have this ability when these secretions dry off and they rise in the air, they remain alive. And they can, you know, cause infections. I am sitting in this room, or maybe I am sitting on this chair of the aircraft. I am, you know, coughing, 
and the person sitting on the front seat also get infected because these droplet nucleus will travel through air. This has still not been reported with monkeypox. So the transmission reported through monkeypox is prolonged direct contact with the lesions, with the secretions, or the fomites. Fomites, which means the clothing, you know, furniture around the patient. Now the same applies to laboratory. When a virus is less transmissible, the conditions for processing the samples, collection of the samples are less stringent. So we will see a change. As of now, CDC and WHO are recommending you go with at least biosafety level two precautions with biosafety level three practices, the same which we did for COVID virus. So we have around in our country now around 3,600 labs out of which 2,000 are private. So we have no dearth of such facilities. All of them are accredited through NABL. And God forbid if this pandemic has another phase and rises, there will be a lot of laboratories to cater to such diagnostic facility requirements. Yeah. Sure. Very interesting insight, sir. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Satish Kaul from FMRI. Sir, uh, I would request if you, you could kindly share some insights regarding clinical outcomes of vaccinated versus non-vaccinated population. And how does it affect the prevalence of a disease like monkeypox? So over to you. Could you just share some insights over this? Thank you, Rinda. First of all, I must apologize for, uh, you know, very strange way of uh, coming onto the forum. I was caught up in hospital, so I had to read somewhere. So I'm attending this session in the middle of my travel. No However, worries, this, not at all. This, uh, this question about, you know, uh, about the clinical aspects of uh, monkeypox. Dr. Vishal has explained in very detailed way how, uh, you know, the labs are equipped now to detect this virus and how we are prepared uh, as far as the diagnostic is concerned to pick up this virus. But surprisingly, as of now, India has only reported nine cases, as you all know. A world about 45,000 cases have been reported in out of that 90 countries where this virus was not endemic are reporting these cases, USA being number one. But we haven't seen any case of uh, you know, monkeypox in our clinical practice as of now. Uh, in Delhi, there were four, four, five cases and uh, in, uh, from Kerala, they were reported five, four cases. So as of now, we haven't seen the clinical outcome in Indian patients about the monkeypox. But as we know uh, from the literature, the, will, virus is, the virus basically causes illness which remains from two to four weeks and it's a self-limiting illness which is manifested by fever, any viral prodrome like fever, myalgia, muscle pains, enlarged lymph nodes, headache, uh, and extreme exhaustion. And then the rash appears once the patient starts manifesting fever, the rash appears within one to two days. And then this rash comes in crops. And these crops, then this rash will again turn into pustules and this, uh, this will, uh, you know, shed out, this will be shed out uh, as a scab. And eventually the patient will become afebrile after a couple of weeks and uh, will stop infecting other people once the scabs are gone completely and the new skin emerges uh, on the lesions. Uh, we are yet to see any cases of uh, uh, monkeypox in our clinical practice, but let's see how this evolves and how this, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, in India, how this spreads. As of now, the government is doing its best, uh, you know, the, 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 the lot of awareness is being created in the media about uh, monkeypox and uh, the preparedness of the government as far as the ICMR is concerned, laying down the guidelines for uh, diagnosing patients, identifying patients. Uh, they are that they're trying to train uh, physicians all over India about uh, the symptoms and how to pick up these cases very soon. And let us see how this evolves in future in India. Very rightfully said, sir. Uh, I would also request you if you can throw some light on how can healthcare resources and funding be rightfully directed towards clinical efficiency. See, as far as funding is concerned for about mon monkeypox, as of now, we are still in very, you know, I would say infancy of development of this outbreak of monkeypox. Why I'm calling this outbreak and not a pandemic because WHO has not declared it as a pandemic. This is still an outbreak. It is as Dr. Vishal has mentioned, 
this is about cases which were not seen outside congo the cases have been reported outside congo and in countries where this has where this is not endemic is coming into picture so allocating funds is still in you know uh, funds right now should be allocated to uh, the labs uh, to the healthcare where the lab diagnostics are concerned identifying this uh, this uh, virus is concerned and making public more aware about how it spreads there is a lot of confusion about how it is spreading as dr vishal has rightly said it is more of close contact with the patients who are infected and of course people especially uh, in the homosexual population population this is seen more mostly in america and europe most of the cases reported have been in, seen in homosexual population so we have to allocate our funds to the right direction where right now we have to upgrade the diagnostics to the you know prevention to preventive methods and all these things as far as the hospital preparedness is concerned we are not still seeing too many patients of monkeypox only nine have been reported in india so we have to wait and watch and see how we evolve our strategy to counter this uh, outbreak of monkeypox sure sir thank you so much for sharing the insights over this moving on to our next speaker dr srinidhi chidambaram from apollo hospitals ma'am i would request to you know help us with some details regarding the current geographical trends for monkey pox and are indian hospitals prepared to handle enough such outbreaks in terms of management operations and clinical teams all inclusive over to you ma'am Ma'am, you are on mute. Uh huh. Thank you, Vrinda, for this opportunity, and uh, uh, I'm so happy to participate with two other eminent speakers. Uh, I think already uh, the geographical trends has been very well uh, discussed, but I just wanted to add that yes, today monkeypox is being discussed because it is uh, now after the smallpox has been eradicated in the 80s. It is one of the most important. Uh, pox it uh, auto pox viruses uh, infections which are going on today uh, epidemiologically speaking of course as doctor already said uh, the interesting fact about it is that it was originally uh, something that was endemic in west and central africa it was largely seen around the tropical rainforests and it was essentially considered a kind of a zoonotic disease where there was an animal to human transmission which is basically from small animal rodents from monkeys which is why it, it the whole thing was completely different but from early may 2022 the scenario has changed that now we are seeing the largest number of uh, cases in the non endemic countries which are largely the uh, americas and europe and here we are seeing that the disease is also uh, not exactly being spread in the same way as the african countries so this is uh, an interesting scenario where concurrently we are having you know both the uh, countries where th there's not been any previously documented monkeypox where it's not endemic and there there is a human to human transmission where it is largely spread through close contact and also uh, there are certain special risk populations like men having sex with men multiple sex partners so it's almost there is also a, a focus on that group whereas in the africas that is also continuing this whole endemic rodent and monkey uh, and zoonotic kind of transmission is also going on so it's interesting to see that you know the current rise the current reason why who has declared this as a kind of concerning situation not a pandemic not like covid it's mainly because you know you find that the largest proportion is actually in these areas where monkeypox was not there at all and also it is not coming through somebody having traveled to the africas and has come back it is independently coming as a separate cluster it is spreading so i think this is an interesting epidemiological situation but again like it is nowhere near the kind of concerning numbers that we saw with covid we still have as of august 30th WHO says forty eight thousand eight ninety five confirmed cases uh, and about fifteen deaths. And in India, as it said, it's just about nine to ten cases in two states. So it hasn't seen that kind of an explosive trend so far, and we hope that it will not. 
Uh, and we also have the WHO saying that there has been a varying trend actually in this 20, 22nd August to 28th August has actually been a slight increase, but the week before that actually showed a decrease in the number of cases. There was a, a certain about 20% decrease actually. So it is not really in the same way as COVID was. And the 10 most affected countries globally have been the US, Spain, Brazil, Germany, France, United Kingdom, South America, that is Peru, Canada, Netherlands. So as I said, it's mainly the Americas and Europe. So this is really about the current situation, but we have to really wait and watch. I think the real uh, issue here is that the virus seems to have gotten into a new way of spreading. It's not the way we traditionally knew monkeypox. So I think, you know, the whole idea is that we have to be very alert in case this virus is going to suddenly mutate again and, you know, start becoming more transmissible, for example, or if they may have other routes of transmission. So that is why we are all a bit concerned about it and not really that it is something that is spreading explosively, especially in India. But it is always, I think, very sensible to uh, have a very cautious approach and be prepared to tackle any eventuality. Sure, ma'am. And it is very really rightly said that we have to be, uh, you know, tackle it in a very with very cautious approach. Yeah, sure. because we need to be, because even the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 virus also was not, uh, initially it was supposed to be coming from bats and then it kind of has undergone so many variations. It's become more transmissible, but thankfully, probably it's, it's less virulent now. So we don't know how these viruses are going to react, which is why answering your other question, it's important that all healthcare organizations are extremely uh, well prepared to tackle any eventuality. I can tell you that in Apollo hospitals, we have uh, issued an advisory and we keep updating the advisory, which follows the national guidelines. But right now, all we are really saying is that it's important for healthcare workers and clinicians to be aware that there is this monkeypox going around. So the advisory to healthcare workers has really been that you need to keep a heightened vigil over people, especially those who come with a, with a kind of an unexplained rash, who have traveled in the last 21 days to countries where there has been monkeypox, or they have been in regular contact with people, uh, close contact with people uh, who have confirmed or suspected monkeypox. They have been instructed to follow all the uh, precautions while taking care of a suspected case of monkeypox, which means that hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, isolation, and you know, separate uh, kind of a facility uh, area for them to be uh, uh, to be examined and treated, and also like using uh, a, a surgical mask, PPE equipment, uh, make sure that the patient's exposed skin lesions are covered. Uh, with a sheet and then all the disposal rules like you know how to dispose the biomedical waste uh, how to you know handle the patient's laundry and linen so there have been detailed advisories given and also how long they should be isolated the, the treatment is of course largely asymptomatic and it is only a self-limiting disease in most cases but the important idea is that we should not let it spread. And I think healthcare workers have to be particularly careful because they will be handling the skin lesions and also coming into close contact with the patient. So we have uh, issued this uh, constant uh, update, constantly updated advisory on uh, how we must uh, be equipped to tackle it. But as the doctors and speakers before me have said, uh, it is not really increased to large numbers. So this is just being uh, very, very cautious. That's it. Sure, ma'am. And ma'am, though you have explained, but slightly in detail, uh, what is the role of public societal habits in the spread of a disease like monkeypox? And another is what can an individual do to prevent getting this particular disease? So basically, I think, you know, the, the rules are uh, quite similar. I think we are a very COVID conscious society right now. So in a way, we are used to being, you know, like being a little 
cautious when we go out but then this is not going to spread in public it's not like covid where it's going to spread from a flight or from a crowded uh, uh, function that you're going to this needs prolonged close contact to spread so i think for both individuals and for the community at large the main thing is that you know you need to be aware that something like this is going on and there is a disease like this where there are initial prodromal symptoms and then there is a rash so it's very important to avoid having this prolonged skin to skin or close contact with somebody who has any of these symptoms or has this rash and i think it's important that if somebody in the family has this they have to if as much as possible be isolated and it's important not to you know freely touch the scabs or the rash and also it's important to avoid intimate contact sexual contact and also close contact long face to face contact and such with people who are suspected to have uh, any of the symptoms like fever body pain there may be prodromal symptoms also and then the lesions and then also in the household it's important that when somebody has monkey pox or suspected important not to handle or share objects like plates or materials that a person has used must be disinfected and when you're handling laundry linen all those uh, objects that a person has used bedding it's important that you know we don't touch it directly and it is handled with proper personal protective equipment and these are the some of the simple rules you know i mean they are not like covid where you know you have to be so vigilant when you're going out but it is largely being watchful and not being in close contact with people who have suspected symptoms of monkey pox of course in the areas like africa where it is still spreading through the zoonotic contact the advisory there might be like you know also avoid touching sick or dead animals or handling their uh, you know the remains and also like you know not eating wild meat bush meat and things like that but right now here i think it's more about avoiding prolonged close contact and that would really be the message that both the community as well as uh, individuals need to follow and i think uh, there has been enough uh, interest generated in monkey pox through you know nowadays uh, everybody is quite aware of everything that's going on all over the world we have social media we have media we have uh, all the national advisories and apart from that there are also for example at apollo hospitals we have been doing quite a lot of uh, social media blogs we have handled uh, we have done a couple of uh, facebook lives and such sessions to just dispel the myths and misconceptions about monkey pox it's a little confusing you know because uh, one has learned of it as one kind of an infection which is zoonotic and now it has suddenly changed and there is this whole thing about you know also men having sex with men and people with prolonged intimate contact getting the disease so there are a lot of aspects to it it is kind of complicated and we don't know how it was going to change also in the future but as of now i think awareness and abundant caution is what is important sure ma'am definitely thank you so much for the insights moving on to dr vadva so uh, i mean in a very layman terms what are the tests uh, the name of test for the general public to know and understand that these are the tests to be you know referred when you are detected with it or you know when you feel like symptoms of monkey pox and what are the latest developments in diagnosing monkey pox okay so so first of all we must understand that the current diagnosis is available with icmr uh, government related laboratories only there are around 15 vdrls which are the centers which are allowed to test for monkey pox including niv pune so having said that sooner or later if this epidemic grows and you know exponentially begins to grow on the community the private laboratories will also have a stake and if we consider that the intelligence uh, drawn through covid is that not only the tests which are directly detecting the virus are important there will be some indirect tests as well so i'll just explain what i'm trying to say here the direct test means where you are trying to direct directly detect the virus and it could be an antigen of the virus or the nucleic acid of the virus this is a dna virus 
So like we had COVID RT-PCR and COVID rapid antigen test kits, such kits will also develop. But as of now, what is recommended by ICMR is the RT-PCR test. And in this PCR test, the first test they are referring to is a general broad test, which covers all the related, you know, you yourself said that this is a virus which is similar to smallpox virus. And this group is known as orthopox virus. So first PCR step is to detect, a, um, use a test which detects all types of pox viruses. And if this test is positive, you can go for a specific monkey pox virus PCR. As of now, this is the gold standard for diagnosis in India, and this will remain for the patients. On research grounds, there can be culture done, but for a private setup or even for a government setup for sake of diagnosis, this will not happen. So the diagnosis will remain or restricted to, will be restricted to PCR and at maximum followed by genomic sequences, sequencing. And that too, I think will happen only once we are seeing more of viral mutations and, you know, variants of concern affecting population in a different way. Having said that, now the intelligence is that uh, person after the uh, dedicated incubation period, which may extend till 21 days, will develop fever. And within one to three days of fever, the patient will have some rash, as uh, Dr. Call said, that this rash will develop through various courses as the rash of chickenpox. And this is the time when we need to collect our sample. Okay. So the sample which will be effective here will not be blood when we talk about the PCR because this viremia is, we still are not on a surer ground that when, till when this viremia will last, which means uh, if I collect a sample on fourth day of rash, will I get a virus or not and through PCR even, despite the fact that I'm suffering from monkeypox. So this being uncertain, the gold standard or the you know referral point is I collect a swab from the lesion itself, which is this cap. And since there will be a lot of crops of rashes um, in different stages on the body, it is recommended whatever wherever the rash has you know surface exposed, you can take a sample from that. Obviously, there should be no ointment or you know antiviral or antibiotic applied over there. Uh, small difference will be that you, we all know, we are all aware of, you know, so much of COVID that we all now are aware of what is viral transport medium. Yeah. The swab is collected and broken and put in a tube. This will not happen with this virus. The current guideline is you need to have a swab and we'll put it in a dry container and transport in a proper temperature. That is one. Other than that, there will be few indirect tests as well. See, there's no test in this world that is 100% sensitive or specific, be it PCR. So when we are going to collect sample from patient, there would be cases as, you know, as Dr. Call said that we still have a limited experience. That is true. We are only nine cases old in India and none of our laboratories have received any sample. But the, you know, the intelligence here is that uh, there's no test that will be 100% sensitive. So we'll collect a blood test as well and we'll look for the sign uh, the clues towards viral disease, which means there will be some increase in WBC or leukocytosis. There can be a decrease in platelets. There can be an altered um, differential leukocyte count. So in a nutshell, we are looking for CBC and an RT-PCR. And this and PCR is to be done from the lesion and CBC obviously is done from blood. So this is what we're looking for when we talk about diagnosis of monkeypox as of now. Serological tests, I don't think so, will hold us way. Antigen test kits are yet to be developed. This is also serology. And antibody, which is which normal people call serology, um, will not go through because there's a lot of, you know, uh, lot of antigenic sharing between the two siblings or the many siblings in the orthopox virus. So this is not uh, currently under consideration. So the test of choice is PCR and the rub off test is the CBC. And also the liver test. So then you will see uh, upswing of liver function test because the liver enzymes, as we saw in, you know, in COVID, uh, liver enzymes being altered, ferritin levels being changed. I don't think so that will happen to that extent. But yes, CBC, LFT and PCR. And PCR will be the test of choice. Very helpful, sir. Uh, moving on to Dr. Call. Sir, I would like to understand how do vaccine efficacy and implementation effectiveness 
play key roles in clinical outcomes. Over to you. Sir. See, when the, the vaccines which are available are still what we call as vaccines for smallpox. There are two vaccines which are available. One is the live attenuated virus. Uh, where this vaccine is basically the efficacy of this vaccine in preventing this uh, monkeypox is not known. There is no data, hardcore data available for effectiveness of a smallpox vaccine which is available with us, a live attenuated virus vaccine, which is available with us. There is no data as far as the monkeypox is concerned. However, uh, the FDA in US has uh, approved this in population, especially in population where this smallpox vaccination has not been given. In India, the smallpox was considered to be eradicated in 1979. And people who were born before 1980s have all been vaccinated for smallpox. However, people who have been born after the 1980s have not been vaccinated for smallpox since it has been declared eradicated after 1979. So how this vaccine will help us in preventing the disease and modifying the clinical outcome of disease is still uh, very few cases are there. So we still do not know how this vaccine is going to be effective in preventing the serious outcomes of the disease. See, we are more aware of vaccine, the role of vaccine as far as COVID is concerned. We know that the COVID vaccine has been able to prevent the severity of the sickness. It has been able to prevent somebody getting admitted to the hospital after taking a vaccine, though one can get uh, this uh, COVID even after getting vaccinated or getting a booster. But as far as this vaccine is concerned and monkeypox vaccine is concerned, one has to understand there is no vaccine as such which has been specifically developed for monkeypox. What the data says is, did, did we presume that the vaccine which is available for smallpox will be somewhere around 85% efficacious against uh, monkeypox. But it's still very early for me to comment on this or because the WHO has not come up with any data, the CDC has not come up with any data about the effectiveness of this, of this vaccine as far as monkeypox is concerned. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to Dr. Chidambaram. Ma'am, uh, are there any community programs, awareness programs currently in India to disseminate information about monkeypox and other such communicable diseases? There are uh, very strong national programs for many of the communicable diseases. So even if you look at uh, at a district level, at the rural primary healthcare level, there is a lot of uh, what they call as information, education and communication strategies by the government of India. Uh, for example, for malaria eradication, for dengue eradication. So they have a multi-pronged approach where there are posters, there are uh, campaigns that go on, there are TV commercials. So starting with something like tuberculosis, National Tuberculosis Prevention Program or Leprosy Eradication Program, or of course, COVID was the all-time uh, I mean, this was the one where recently we had an explosion of communication and content and media. Uh, uh, it, even on the phones, to, even today, you find people, the, the voice message coming that, you know, you need to take the vaccines. So I think uh, there has been always a lot of public health education programs, of course, for the HIV, for, uh, uh, for every single thing, even for antenatal, for tetanus vaccinations for antenatal mothers. So you would find that even if you go to a sub-center or a primary health center in a village or to the district health center or to the government medical college, everywhere uh, you do have uh, communications in terms of materials. And I myself, I mean, like even we have seen in village areas when they were posted and even right now you know not only is it through the doctors but or through the media but even the personnel like people in the primary health care center the village health nurse uh, 
these people even today play a large role in mobilizing and motivating the local community for example uh, in rural areas, even today, the community health nurse still goes and asks the pregnant mothers there to come for an antenatal checkup or for the people who have not yet had their COVID vaccines to get that COVID vaccination. So we have a strong program in our country where uh, all the national health programs are implemented in, in the three-tier approach of the primary, secondary, and tertiary healthcare facilities and coming to the private uh, and corporate healthcare uh, as well. There is a lot of effort made by uh, the private healthcare uh, groups as well to create uh, as much information as possible. And that is a lot of it is in the online space as well. So the social media channels, the videos, the talks by the doctors, the interactions like these, the Facebook live programs, uh, Instagram. So everything is now being used by uh, both the government and by the private players to create uh, awareness, uh, to create, uh, uh, you know, and also another important thing is not only to create awareness, but also to dispel the myths and misconceptions. So we saw a lot of this during COVID where, you know, there were a lot of these uh, false perceptions, a lot of wrong information, a lot of fears, a lot of rumors, all kinds of things were also being circulated. So it's also important to debunk all those things. So I think, you know, there's been a huge role that both the government and the private health sector has been playing in trying to dispel, uh, trying to run helplines, trying to have queries answered. Uh, so these things are all happening, not only just for monkeypox or for COVID, but from time immemorial in whichever way people, you know, if they watch TV, then it's on TV. If they are on Facebook, then these kind of uh, programs come through that. Or if there is uh, somebody who's going to, you know, like uh, come to a hospital, there are posters and pamphlets and, you know, in regional languages and through people like motivating people like the village health nurse and other such personnel in the healthcare uh, uh, hierarchy. Uh, so through this, there has always been, because without creating awareness, it's very difficult to control uh, communicable diseases as well as non-communicable diseases, of course, but awareness is very important. Sure, ma'am, sure. So uh, thank you everybody. It was indeed a very pertinent discussion. I have personally benefited from this session. And it's such an honor to express my deepest gratitude to all the experts of the session who have, who have added immense value and insights on various topics. I would, like to, yeah. I would like to thank all of you on behalf of Nat Health Secretariat. It would have, you know, we would have liked to thank all the participants for joining the session and all who have been watching the session live on our social media. We would like to thank our PR team, AVNV, our organizing team, and our communications partner, HealthBiz Insights, for their constant support. My special thanks to Mr. Siddharth Bhattacharya and Anvisha Pandey for their immense support, as always. Just wanted to let you know, we will be back again with another set of speakers throwing light on the another interesting topic in our upcoming sessions. We will be posting the video of this session on our social media handles and YouTube channels for all of you to like and share it amongst your community. And please don't forget to subscribe our channels. With this, we are about to bring this session to a closure. Thank you in making this session a resounding success. Bye-bye and have a good evening. Thank you.